Right, so I'm very happy now to start the community part of this hustings. Uh, we have Matt and Maisie here. Um, again, a reminder that you can tweet questions at Bath Q2C uh, and we'll try and read them out to the candidates. Um, the candidates now have a minute each to make their opening remarks uh, and we'll start with Matt. You have one minute. Hi, uh, I'm Matt and last year um, I've been chair of V-Team for the last two years and last year I took V-Team from 350 to 932 members. That's just one of the many voluntary roles I've had um, over my time at university. Um, and not only is my voluntary experience, I probably, it's difficult to say, but I probably know more about volunteering than most other students at the university. But apart from that, I've also got a lot of passion and interest in a course university, and this year I've started to get more involved in that as well. So I think I would make a really good community officer candidate. And now Maisie. Hi, I'm Maisie, and I'm running because I want to change the structure of the SU and the way people run in these elections. I don't just want to say, I want to represent all students, because I can, no one can. I want to set up liberation officers and a student assembly to make sure the SU is democratic, accountable, and representative. And this structure is what exists in almost all other SUs in the country. So I want to bring Bath up to date. Thank you. So the first question is about housing. Um, and it's how are you going to deal with the council to make sure that student housing needs are being met? And we're going to start with Maisie. Okay, so the cost of living, I think, is one of the biggest problems that's facing students at the moment, with rent in halls increasing every year and also in the private sector. I'd look into um, getting rent caps in the community and lowering rent in halls. How do you think you're going to get rent caps out of interest? Sorry? How do you think you're going to get rent caps uh, with the council? I think for that sort of thing, it's important to encourage students to become councillors, as many students as we can, to get involved in local politics, so then they can, they can have more influence on this sort of thing, have put pressure on the council, and I think this sort of thing's been achieved in other places. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt? Um, so, to really tackle what, what I think really the, the main, main issue of all the issues we've had with housing really come down to that students aren't really valued that much in the local community and the image of students is pretty poor. Um, so I really want to improve the image of students and I've already worked quite closely with the council uh, through various bits of volunteering like as a trustee of the volunteer centre um, and I think using those contacts and my already have a good reputation with for certain members of the council that me as a as a person would be able to put across um, would be able to make the change needed to improve the image of students and therefore when councillors are making policies then they can they're, they're going to more they're going to look at they're going to think about students more when they're making those policies rather than disregard them because they don't think that they're they don't value students as much so really improving the image of students is the way that I think we should go about tackling the housing issues. Thank you. So Matt, what are you going to do about student housing up on campus, do you think? Um, so my biggest plans for improving housing or halls on campus, um, I want to set up a casual education system, um, which will hopefully tackle social isolation. Um, I'll do that by asking students that are more likely to be socially isolated. So for example, um, we've got students that are in their second plus year who are stay on campus because they have a disability, um, then I would, make, I would allow them the option of being able to be in the same halls as someone else that's also um, got, those, got, got that same characteristic. Um, similarly, international students have the issue that if, they're, if they, they, they often come over here and try and, and want to improve their English, um, but they often find that they're in the same halls as other international students and therefore don't have the opportunity to improve their English as much. And further, I'd like to improve pre-arrivals information. I think one of the big issues has been, it always comes up every year, that it's very difficult to understand what your room number means. And that's just one thing that really kind of puts you off 
as you start on your first steps of coming to university, you've got that issue of not really understanding one thing, and being able to make it that a lot easier is definitely the way of going about that. Thank you, uh, Maisie. What would you do about student halls on campus? Well, I think it's awful that the university are talking about putting effort into widening participation when they keep building new luxury halls that, I mean, at the moment, only three out of all of the options are covered by the minimum maintenance loan. Like, and that's just completely unacceptable. There's, there's all these students who, who, don't, who don't have the income, their, their parents earn too much so that they don't get the hardship grants, they don't get the maintenance grants, but they don't, their parents don't earn enough so that they are getting um, their rent paid for them. They're just completely stuck. They're having to work through their course to pay their way. They're not earning the living wage. They've got zero hour contracts. It's, so I think the difference between me and candidates who normally say that they're going to lower rent is that I'm coming from a perspective of I'm going to campaign for it through, like, I'm not just going to ask nicely. I think, like, Universities that have achieved things like Birmingham achieving the living wage, they've done that through occupations, not through writing a polite letter and raising it in a committee meeting. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, sadly, due to time, we have to move on to the next uh, issue, uh, which is student finance. So the first question is to Maisie, um, and that is, how do you think you're going to help um, students in their financial situation? And do you think that's um, going against zero-hour contracts is really a good way to help students in difficult positions. Well, so about zero hour contracts, I understand that they're popular with students. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm a work on a zero hour contract for the ICIA, but we need to look into alternatives for flexible contracts. And there are many alternatives. And I think that you've got to remember that zero hour contracts really discriminate against women workers who don't have any maternity pay and disabled workers who, if they're suffering from a long term illness, won't, if they have to have time off because they're ill, then they'll get nothing. They're entitled to nothing. So if they're relying on their job to pay their way from uni, then they're going to have to go home. So I think it's a bit selfish to, to say, oh, well, we want zero hour contracts because they're, you, know, you need to look into alternatives because you're ignoring the students who are really, really disadvantaged by them. So what sort of alternative are you thinking about? There's um, student, um, like there's, there's lots of alternatives where, so basically you, uh, it's an agreement where you say you're going to work like a certain number of hours a month and then you just do that whenever you sign off when you're available to, but it's not zero hour, it's say like 20 hours a month or something like that, whatever. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, the question next question is to Matt, and in your manifesto you've talked about um, having bar tabs so people know prices. Um, do you really think it's going to help students with their finances, or have you got something more meaningful uh, to deal with people in like hard-pressed financial situations? I think it's a small step, I don't think it's you know, it's not, it's not some sort of big thing that's going to really revolutionise and make student living cheaper, but it's the start of an idea of trying to find ways of, you know, doing every, if we try and do every little thing we can to really try and make every, everything cheaper, if there's ways that we can look at um, food on campus and if that can be made cheaper, then that's another option. I think it's, it's looking at the everyday expenses and how that can be made cheaper. Um, and I think uh, making prices for drinks on tap um, clearer is one way that students are more, uh, even if they're not necessarily spending less, they're more um, conscious of the fact of the money that they're spending. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move on to international students. Um, so Matt, actually, you haven't mentioned international students that much in your manifesto. What's your stance and what do you think you're going to do to make sure their needs are being represented in the SU? I'd say that I have... I may not have mentioned the words international students quite a few times, but I definitely have policies in my manifesto that relate to that. Um, I want to get more cultural events throughout the year. Um, at the moment, we've got um, One Bath Week, which is a great event, but I think it definitely needs to be... I think a lot of the issues that um, have been raised by international students are that there isn't really enough for them throughout the whole year that's kind of catered by the SU rather than by specific groups. And I think it's not just international students that would benefit that from also other students, and that would make a more 
Um, it would appreciate diversity and hopefully help people understand other cultures, appreciate them more. Um, again, as I mentioned with my cash allocation system, that would help international students um, help improve English. Um, other international issues, um, obviously there are things like uh, the visa issues which um, students are having and also um, I think one of the limitations um, is currently that a lot of international students because of the country that they originally come from um, find that they're, they're not really as conscious of what mental health issues are and so when they come over here then although I think generally the UK is much more accepting of mental health issues um, other cultures aren't, so it's raising awareness of that, which will also help benefit in, uh, international students. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, so, Maisie, on your manifesto, you talk about international guarantor forms. Sorry? You talk about international guarantor forms. Um, yeah. The SU is already doing this. What else are you going to do to make sure international students are well represented in the SU? I want to create an international students officer alongside other liberation officers. These elections would be held at the same time as these elections, as sabbatical elections, and it would make sure that their representation is embedded in the structure of the SU, so that no matter who gets elected as community officer, they can't ignore international students. Do you think you're likely to get that, or get the funding for a new officer? So, I think for the funding, so I understand there's practical implications with, with providing paid liberation officers, but I think you've got to ask if this, well, the university made a surplus of 11,000, 16.9 million pounds last year, and the VC has just got a pay rise of 11,000 pounds, taking her pay up to 395,000 pounds. So keep on the topic, do you think? This is on the topic. So to claim that the university cannot afford to give the SU more funding to pay for the representation of students is like, you know, that's coming from an, an austerity narrative, which is saying that the people who lose out when we need to save money is most vulnerable groups in society, and I think that's completely unacceptable. Okay. The university can afford it. Thank you for that. Okay, we're now going to move on to um, a more specific issue, which is that but the Westwood um, by a hind quarry, they're thinking about building a new car park there. What do you think your stance, we'll start with Matt here, what would your stance be on the construction of this car park? I think one of the things that I found disappointing over my time at university is that I've seen more of the green and open spaces um, taken away, like there's a building that's getting built by the archery pitches and things like that. Um, and it's just a bit, you know, so I would be disappointed, but I think in terms of being realistic about, you know, student numbers are going to increase, that, you know, we need to find space. And if we don't build accommodation um, or, or parking or whatever, then that's going to be a, an issue that's going to affect students because it's going to affect their welfare, you know, uh, the, the reason that there's more accommodation that's being built is because it's trying to um, get less students live in their first year having not guaranteed accommodation and um, yeah, I think like with parking that's a definitely um, something that particularly affects postgrads. Um, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. So although I'm, I think protecting the green spaces is important and um, I know that in the past, um, accommodation is built where people have been playing football before and they really enjoyed that in part of their halls. Um, I think that in, in, on balance, that is definitely something that is worth um, supporting. Thank you. Um, Macy, have you got any comments on this? Yeah, I mean, that green space is used by the nursery, so it would I mean, our campaign against building of a car park there. Do you not think that, that postgrads, uh, they specifically need more car parking? Do you not think that's going against their needs, um, even if it is like helping the nursery? Um, well, maybe that's the sort of thing where it could be discussed in a student assembly. Um, Andrew, what do you mean by a student assembly? So by a student assembly, I mean, we did have a student council before, but this one would be um, just open meetings that anyone could attend, anyone could submit motions to. So it's not like a clique of people that are involved in the SU or elected to positions. It's anyone could go, just propose a motion, discuss it, second it, you know, and then it was something would be decided on. So if students wanted to start a campaign, then it would be so much easier to ensure that the SU was accountable, democratic, and more transparent. 
Um, this one, the, uh, the old council was actually disbanded a while back yeah. um, because it's like, inefficient and didn't get much done. Why do you think it's going to be different this time? It would be different because it wouldn't be like, led by top-down structure of SE officers. It would be open to anyone. Okay, thank you. That actually takes us nicely on to the next topic, which is on equities. Um, so we'll go to Matt first. Is how do you intend to investigate social isolation? Um, what do you think you can actually do about it um, in terms of like real policies to try and alleviate that? Um, so practically, I think that um, an issue that quite a lot of students have is that if they're concerned about a fellow housemate or course mate, um, at the moment, they don't really have a way of being able to deal with that. It's just, okay, do, do I speak to them? Do I leave them? Is that what's best? Um, and I don't think people are really aware of what's best to try and help someone that they're concerned about. Um, so that's definitely something that I want to try and develop. And um, I've kind of been toying over the idea of whether, it's, whether it would be acceptable for the Students' Union to get directly involved in you know, interfering, if you like, um, with students that are closing themselves off and might be um, considered, you know, there might be a, 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 an issue for their, their own personal welfare um, or whether that's too invasive. Um, again, that's something that I'd have to look more into depth with. Um, in terms of other sort of ways of tackling socialization, again, more cultural events and other ways of um, kind of having things that students want to engage in uh, is definitely a, a route to do that. Um, and again, um, with things like a lot of my um, uh, points on equality and diversity um, really kind of tackle the issues that may lead to students kind of shutting themselves off from everyone else, whether that's tackling sexual harassment or um, raising awareness of minority LGBT issues. Thank you. Um, we're going to go back to Maisie, and this is, this is a question from the floor and also one we had prepared, and it's about uh, liberation officers. Um, we've already talked about funding, but what I want to know is, firstly, how are you going to change SU policy on part-time students? And also, do you not think that a liberation officer is a slight superfluous role, seeing as we already have gender equality execs? Okay, so, no, I don't think liberation officers are a superfluous role, because almost every other SU in the country has both of these things. They have reps, they have the support groups, and they also have liberation officers. The thing about liberation officers is they will have the most, as much power within the SU as the sabbatical officers. And they're going to be embedded into the SU's bylaws and structure so that no matter who comes along, so, no, so there, there could be, say, say like, Matt would be great, I would be great, Tommy's been great, Sally was great the year before without having liberation officers, but still not really representative. But then who's to say that someone's not going to be elected as community officer who doesn't really care or know anything about equality and diversity, refuses to cooperate with the support groups and just does nothing for these students. People have been elected before on manifestos for community that only talk about buses and 815s. So, on the other point, do you think you're going to change the SU's... Could you say they're going to be part-time officers? Do you think you're going to change the SU's, sta SU's stance on part-time employment just so you can get your liberation officers? Yeah, because it's the norm everywhere else and it's completely unacceptable and unrepresentative that we don't have it. At the moment, all our SU is is a place to go and get drunk or... Well, that's it, right? Like, what else is it? It needs to be representative, it needs to be democratic. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to go to a few questions from Twitter, if that's okay. So, the first one we're going to have from Matt, which is, how do we increase inclusivity in SU activities and in sports? Okay, um, I think that one of the things is to really... Personally, I think that in terms of the lad culture campaign, that we need to think about that differently. We need to really split that into parts and tackle the specific issues like sexual harassment and catcalling, um, you know, all the, all, tackle it into parts where it can actually be dealt with. Um, that is a way that then student groups can really concentrate on the specific issues rather than trying to tackle something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, but obviously that's one thing. Um, in terms of 
inclusivity so I think, of other... Because we haven't got much time. Um, Maisie, what do you think you're going to do to improve inclusivity in sports and activities? Okay, so I think, again, I think this is why having a team of liberation officers is really important. Because I think a lot of the prop what lad culture basically is, is a sense of entitlement people have, and a sense that people feel like they're the being a white straight cis male is the default student. And seeing the SU only as a place to go and get drunk, I mean, I, I don't mean that that's all the SU is. The SU does great work, but people don't really know about it unless they're already involved. That's what I meant by that. So I think having a team of liberation officers would raise the profile of equality and diversity and just make it, you know, a community officer would work really closely with all of these people to make sure that, you know, to lead campaigns and to make sure there was inc inclusivity and diversity. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we run out of time, sadly. So you all now, you have 30 seconds for a brief summary statement, and we'll start with Macy. So you have 30 seconds. I just think, yeah, closing, closing remarks, basically. Yep. So this year, I want next year, I want to um, create a student assembly within the SU. I want to create part-time liberation officers. I want to campaign for the living wage for all staff and student staff. I want to campaign for a freeze on international student fees, which change every year arbitrarily. I want to campaign for equal access to higher education for refugees and asylum seekers. Thank you very much. And now to Matt. Um, one of my big priorities next year is really to improve mental health. It's a really big issue and I think we really, really need to do something about it soon. Uh, a recent survey showed that um, more than 10% of students have had suicidal thoughts in the last year. Um, so setting up a mental health diversity support group, introducing Mental Health Awareness Week, and really reviewing the quality and accessibility of the services is really important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like a big round of applause for all the candidates.